Hi, everyone. Um, so thank you so much for joining. Um, really, it's a distinct pleasure to introduce the, um, this year's John Evans Lecture. Um, my name is Erica D. Ruggiero, and I'm an Associate Professor of Global Health and the Director of the Center for Global Health at the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. And I'm really delighted to invite all of you, um, those of you in the room, and we have many more people joining online, over 54 people, last count, so delighted by the interest. Um, I'd like to first just start off by um, acknowledging the land upon which the University of Toronto um, sits. It is on the traditional territories of the Mississauga of the New Credit First Nation, Anishinaabe, Wendat, Huron, and Haudenosaunee Indigenous peoples. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wombat Bell Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. And I think it's um, a land acknowledgement is one of many ways in which we um, better understand um, the fact that we are on stolen land and that this land belongs to others. And I would encourage those of you joining online to also think um, for a moment to acknowledge what territory you're joining from. Um, I'd like to first um, introduce, before I start to introduce our esteemed panelists, I'd like to take a moment um, to acknowledge a special guest that we have online, and that's um, John Evans' um, son, Tim Evans, who um, is going to offer a few words um, of greetings, and then I'll, uh, you'll get me back, and then I'll be able to uh, set up this lecture. So can we go to Tim online? Hopefully this will work. Hi, Erica. Um, can you hear me? Um, I'm I'm speaking now. You Erica. are being heard as well. That's great. Great. Okay. okay. Great. Welcome, uh, Tim. Thanks, Erica, and and thanks for uh, including me in this uh, great um, occasion that you've created. Um, uh, I just uh, will briefly say. Uh, words is one of the descendants of uh, John R. Evans. Uh, there are a number of us, we're not quite sure how many, but there are at least six officially of the next generation of which I'm number five of six. And my sister may be joining in person uh, later today. But just to say that uh, uh, my father in some respects um, pioneered new models of uh, health professional education uh, back in the 1960s. And um, uh, through the McMaster um, uh, medical program, uh, introduced problem-based learning as a change in the way in which physicians at the time were trained. It was a little bit revolutionary back then, but I think uh, with respect to today's lecture, um, uh, it was really a recognition that in universities, our job is not simply to educate uh, uh, the next generation. It's to question whether or not we're educating to solve the health problems that confront us. And I think um, that was perhaps a little bit of what drove uh, my father's vision in introducing problem-based learning uh, in the 1960s. But if uh, we fast forwarded, uh, uh, nearly 60 years to 1923, I don't think he would have ever imagined anything as ambitious or intrepid as what Dr. Agnes Binaguajo is doing with the University of Global Health Equity. Uh, and I think this idea of creating new universities to address pressing health problems, but most importantly, to think more actively about how we train and how we use the university to be on the cutting edge of education for that next uh, generation, that next cohort of health professionals that are going to address the complex health problems that confront us. I think uh, he would have been uh, truly uh, amazed to see uh, this sort of leadership, not only in one country, but across many countries underlined uh, and united by 
uh, this focus on health equity. So uh, with that, I just simply like to say um, uh, how pleased and how proud he would be uh, to, uh, uh, to be witnessing this leadership uh, that will uh, have the opportunity and privilege to learn more about today with uh, Dr. Agnes Minowaho uh, providing uh, this lecture. So Agnes, um, wonderful to see you again. Uh, you're a treasure, uh, not only here in Canada, uh, but everywhere. And thank you for your leadership. And we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tim. I'm really delighted you were able to join and that technology actually was <laughs> working in our favor. Um, I just wanna say a word or two about the John R. Evans lecture. So it was actually first established by a former president of this university, Dr. David Naylor, when he was um, actually the Dean of Medicine and then subsequently became the president of U of T. And um, also when the Center for International Health Research Conference was led by Dr. David Zakis. So the actual inaugural keynote was delivered by the man himself, Dr. John R. Evans. And we've been really privileged to have amazing lectures and, so, and this year's lecture is no exception. So thank you again, Professor Agnes for joining us. So this lectureship is actually meant to acknowledge the major role Dr. Evans played, as you've already heard from Tim, also in many universities, but also this one and his global contributions to the advancement of human health and well-being. So I'm just going to do a few little housekeeping things, which I know you're all dying to hear about, but uh, you know, it's, must, it's a must do um, because this is a hybrid event. And so I just want to join, uh, welcome all of you here. And we have a number of people online. And so we'll be trying to manage as many questions as possible from in the room and online. And for those of you who actually are joining online, you can direct any comments, reactions, or questions using the Q&A function, which I think we're all well trained on on Zoom after three years of the pandemic. Um, and um, so without further ado, what I'm going to do is um, first introduce uh, Professor Agnes Binawaho, and then um, introduce um, Professor Joe Long, and, um, and then um, Tolu Oju, um, who will be our discussants, and then we'll move to the uh, question and answer period. So that's kind of how this is going to flow. So you've all seen very extensive biographies, and I'm not going to do justice to your amazing career, and I've had the pleasure of getting to know uh, Professor Agnes over the last couple of days since she arrived in our very cold city, and unfortunately I can't control the weather. There are some things I wish I had superpowers, but I could not control that. So I think as you've read, <clears throat> Professor Agnes recently held the position until, I guess, last fall, or our fall, um, as Vice Chancellor, uh, Chancellor and co-funder of the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda. Um, she was also the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Health and also the Minister of Health for many years. She is a professor of pediatrics. She was also named among the 100 most influential African women for 2020 and 2021. And I could go on and on, but I think this is a testament to her influence in many sectors, the university sector community, in medicine, in senior leadership roles within government. And so I think she brings very unique perspectives to what we're about to hear. So delighted to welcome you. So. Um, you will provide, I guess, an, a, a presentation for about 45 minutes, and then I'm going to invite Joe and then Tolu to offer some reflections. So without further ado, um, please join me in welcoming Professor Agnes. Okay, good, good afternoon, everybody. Hello, never speak in front of sleeping people. Good, good, because you feel my energy. <laughs> so we are going to talk about uh, global health equity. Uh, we are still, some countries are still facing the consequences of COVID-19. Other countries have started life again, like before. Uh, but the question is, where do we go from there? What have we learned? What this pandemic have taught us? 
to be better. Of course, I have a technique. It's uh, what we have all faced during COVID is very important to take decision on how we are going to lead in the health sector in the future. So the ground of the current situation, I'm talking about Africa, the continent I know the best, but in this country also, you had other people, other color, their land was stolen, their good was stolen, and they became citizen of second zone. And among them are the most vulnerable group of today. So you cannot organize a health sector if you don't know the history of the place where you are working. Even if you come for 10 days or 10 years. And also it's important to know that global health education across the globe is concentrated in the Western world in the countries that were the former colonizer. And this also, it's important to know, because if we want to make sure to avoid bias, to really help create a sector that serve the vulnerable, you can forget the, the others they will always find their way to, get, to be served. But you need to know the history of the place where you serve. And this is why it's important, especially because global health education is located in the Western world. And that the people who are taking the course, majority, come from those zones and also it's not everywhere there are many of those schools who are disconnected from reality and uh, you face that when you are open you face it when you are working and don't believe that because people doesn't tell that to you, that they don't feel it. This is important to know. Everybody is not talkative like I am. Mm -hmm. And they just think that you miss an opportunity for true exchange and contribute to true rapid change that are possible. So I'm going to talk during a minute about the challenges of the African uh, health workforce, just because I'm coming from Africa, but it's because also it's the country where it is the most um, acute. In Sub-Saharan Africa, we have uh, two physicians for 10,000 people. According WHO, we should have 10 physicians for 10,000 people. The majority of uh, health workforce are not professionals, meaning they are educated, they receive education through the Ministry of Health or sometimes the Ministry of Education, but not a standardized one. And most of the case, they are asked to do far more than the education provide them as skills and thanks god that they are there if not people will not be treated at all because there is not enough physicians and nurses to provide the care but it's important to notice and to know and these slides is to show you that the fact that there is less health professionals in the low and mid income countries, you can see the impact it has in publications. 
And it's so important because people doesn't know really what happened in our countries. And also, I don't know if I have the slide for that, but you will see that when people coming from low and middle income countries are writing about what they do every day, Lancet, BMG, and others doesn't consider them. They consider more people coming from this part of the world writing about what they do. It's a scandal. Hmm? And a lack of recognition. So why it's so important to start thinking and how to change that? And I agree with you, the ball is in the end of African countries. Hmm? I don't say that the ball is in your hands. It's just to open and to start a discussion. And also to change your mindset the day you come and work in our countries. 74% of all deaths globally are due now to non-communicable diseases. And 77% occur in low and mid-income countries where also you have the majority of deaths due to infectious disease. We have also the fact that the low and mid income countries invest a lot in educating their people and you find them here. And nobody found that scandalous. Imagine that I own a football team. I grow some players since they are young. They became good. And another team come and stole them. <laughs> they will, we, we, will go, we will end in tribunal and I will win. But for health professional, it's not the case. If I take the example of Africa, there is a lot of investment to educate and those people end here and you welcome them. I remember advertisements at the beginning of COVID from this part of the world to steal our nurses. You can come, you will have all the people immediately. I wanted to really go to tribunal and sue them. In one hand, they pretend helping us to educate and save our people. And in the other hand, first attempt, they come and pick them openly. There was not enough complaint. And please be careful. There will never be enough health workers in the world. But don't steal from the place where there is the less. So in 2017, to estimate the cost, it cost low and mid income country $2 billion. This movement of educa educate and give. And the help received from the, low, uh, from the high income countries to develop the low income countries is less than that. So it is hypocrisy. It is unfair and it is planned. Now also, um, this slide is just to show you that we, there is a lack of health professional all over the world, here in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, but the place where there is it's the highest, it's in Africa. And we don't have so far enough health high, uh, institution of high education to solve the problem quickly. So if things continue to go as it goes now, in 100 years, you will see somebody else coming here in another suit with another public talking about the same thing. COVID-19 has impact all health science education everywhere. We were all surprised. Some countries more than others. 
some countries were more, better equipped than others to uh, find solution, lack of PPE, lack of internal structure to protect. Uh, the effect of lockdown has impacted our communities differently. Uh, according what was uh, planned to support communities to be locked down. Uh, there was a delay in many academic programs and a disruption in many uh, um, uh, classes. And also uh, the fact that many in many low-income countries, there were not enough uh, infrastructure for ICT it stopped simply. Other places, there were a compensation. It was not as good, but at least there was a continuation uh, using video or tele uh, or distance uh, learning. But many countries in the developing world were not able to follow that. And also, during that period, money was diverted to respond to COVID, what is normal but there was less money for research or all the research were uh, really oriented. There was not so much research during that period. However, we know that we should have done a lot of research because this is really when the community are stressed and we should have understood what to do, how to, to, to do better, to convince. You remember in some countries, they just deny the fact. How come? how can we convince better the communities how can we reconcile the communities with the science communities don't trust the science anymore how can what can we do what type of research or action we can do to reconcile communities with the science if we don't manage to find that answer and to do things differently, I think we can close a lot of universities. Because at the end of the day, universities are there for improving the health of the communities. So we need to reconnect. And we need to bring trust again. We need to dissociate, dissociate sorry, ourselves with the liars of some pseudo-scientists and some real politicians. What has happened? Should have the scientific community stood up a little bit more strongly? Yes. Because by being silent, we have contributed to death the contrary of our vocation. So COVID have taught that as well. And this should be a reflection. What are the human duty of the scientific community? Very important. So the SDGs are soon there. What role can play high education? You can see the difference between low and mid-income countries and high-income countries. The population, the majority are in low and mid-income countries. However, look at the publication. They publish only 20% of the scientific uh, articles, books. They face 90% of the burden of disease. The high income countries face around 10 and publish 80%. Also, there's something missing in this slide. It's not because you publish that your community have access to it. And this is so important. The publication is already low, but the access is so. And this is a denial that we should think about. As scientific, we love to be published 
in very indexed journal, those are the ones that are not accessible to the people. We are talking about in our research. You remember when Ebola was um, spreading in West Africa? You had so many people say, oh, it's the first time. What happened? We never faced that. I know. Go 20 years before in the Lancet, there, were an, there was an article on Ebola in the same, on the same region. However, the scientific of that region to have an access to the Lancet um, to pay uh, an, an uh, abonnement, uh, we say a subscription to the Lancet, it was more than one month of my salary as minister at that time. So, of course, I have priorities. So that means there is what we know and there is what the people can access in the global knowledge. And there is a discrepancy, especially that concern the people who face those diseases. We should also promote implementation science. It's new and the definition is not the same for everybody. It's time, you know, for clinical uh, trial also, it took years for the scientific community to give a definition. Mm -hmm. So we should not be intimidated by that. But implementation science is how we implement the, what we know for better health. And the majority of the research stop before. You do research to prove this, etc. You are happy, you go to the next. No, you did nothing for the humanity. You should be happy the day your results improve the health of the people. And we should really shift our mind around that truth. That's for country. We should stop vertical program. There is a lot of money for HIV. And HIV is 3% of the burden of the, uh, for my community, for example. And I think that globally it's the same. However, because it was in the wind, we create global fund for HIV, TB, and malaria. And because it was in the wind, they create PEPFA. And all the money in place to go and strengthen the health sector, go to answer specific disease that doesn't affect more than 7% of the people. And we just say yes. And we just smile. And sometimes we just even say thank you. It's not normal. This money should strengthen the health sector and strengthen community, give the capacity, and it will prevent HIV far better. And help by creating a health sector that is strong, it will help the people affected by the disease to remain alive. It will reinforce the procurement system, etc., etc. Some countries have done that, but it was a fight. And now you just go to all those big boss in PEPFA and Global Fund and you say, you remember how we fought when I, I want to put the money in a, a central store to reinforce the whole system and you say, if you do that, we cut the money. We never say that. That's not true, Agnes. Huh? Yes, they did. It was for HIV and for HIV only. Like, the person suffering for HIV, the woman will not be pregnant, will not have a baby, the baby has to be vaccinated, the woman needs the, the vaccine against tetanus, etc., etc., etc. So you don't build the health sector by building it as a puzzle. You build the health sector holistically for the people. If not, you'll get some very strange things, like I remember a child. There was uh, a lot of things done for women who are HIV positive, among them uh, paying uh, school staff for the kids. And a kid, another kid went to the radio and said, I wish my mom was HIV positive. So everybody was shocked. Yeah, because if she was, I will have also new staff to go to school. 
and new shoes. So you understand the, 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 how vicious we can be by supporting people in a puzzle way. So we have also to plan for equity, not equality. And uh, because the vulnerable will always be left out. And this can concern around 20% of a population. So to do that, you also need to build trust. You have seen COVID is really something that we need to study for years. COVID told us that people prefer to die in some countries than to trust the government. That's terrible. Can you imagine? People who dedicate their life, I guess, to organize a country, and because they give some instruction and advice, people go and do the contrary because of them. I think about the mask in UK. It's so, it's so incredible. 10 years ago, we, we, were, we, we would have been told that. We'll say, no, it will never happen. It's not possible. It happened. Because some people say something, the others will go and do the contrary because of who they are. So we need also cross-sector collaboration. And this has been forgotten. People believe that I mean, the health sector, this is done, this is good, not at all. We need the transport sector with us to transport the drugs. We need the, the airplane sector with us to, to control. We need to work as a team at country level. And we need to work as a team regionally because you cannot, we cannot control in one country and not uh, and believe it will be done for, for the region. Hmm? And if you don't do that, all your effort in this country will be uh, useless. And when we do that, we need also to base our argument on the tradition and the cultural values of the people we are talking to. There are some people just because you are culturally incorrect who will not listen to you and they close the door they close the door for their family their communities etc so if you don't take the time with humility to see how best to talk and how best to give the message you kill people it's not that you are not listened to, simply you kill them because you can, could have saved them. Innovation, there will always be innovation. There are so many innovations that are across the world, but not share enough. Like this robot who just goes somewhere and when they found somebody with uh, temperature, they say, do 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 and uh, so uh, it, uh, during COVID, it was very important to open to the citizen public venue. Uh, having that was important. You have drones. Rwanda was the first country to use drones. Very useful uh, to transport blood because it took uh, 35 minutes maximum and no four hours going across the hills and coming when the people are dead. So there is a lot of innovation that we should promote. We should also uh, be careful of um, um, predictions. The majority of the index and the prediction now are biased by the white supremacy uh, mindset. What comes from Africa, of course, should not be good. What they do, of course, we should not learn from them because uh, there is no reason they are not good. And COVID show us the contrary. Look at those two maps, the up. 
It was the prediction done by Global Health Security Index in 2020, in case there is a pandemic. It was like that. Africa is done. We will have 10 million deaths in Africa. Hmm? There was an epidemic and Africa didn't face that. But in place to try to understand why they just start a recuperation because it's not possible. They say first, I remember, it was too hot for the virus to survive. They forgot in California, it's hot also. <laughs> and, and they went and went and went up to the time they had nothing to say. Hmm? And they forgot the only thing that has saved us is that CDC Africa was just created and Genga song, John, that you stole from us, by the way, is running PEPFA now. Huh? He had the double nationality, was uh, stolen by the Amer American um, administration. Uh, just call all the ministers of health, all of them. They were called in Ethiopia, one week before the first case on the continent. And they discuss, they brought WHO, and they say, the European uh, doesn't, they don't take that seriously. Don't do the same. First of all, we doesn't have reanimation. We doesn't have the, in, the, the health infrastructure to save people if they are sick. So our only way is to prevent. So all the countries were informed. They forgot that it was a matter of organization and system moving. That's how we were protected. And that's how, if I remember well, I take the, uh, my country as an example. If somebody, before the first case in Africa, everybody have to say where they were sitting in the plane, etc. So it was um, computerized immediately for all plane. So when there was a case, everybody was recalled whatever place they are in Rwanda. And some just crossed Rwanda were in Congo, etc. The, the, the other countries were informed. We create a regional, it was not enough celebrate, but we create a regional reaction. And this has protected us. It's not that we didn't have cases, but we didn't had an epidemic and of course a pandemic because uh, of action taken. So um, the North also have this disease to think that they have nothing to learn from others. And that's not good because there is a lot to learn from other parts of the world. Look how Vietnam managed this. And also, how Africa manages it show us that it's not a matter of money. It's a matter of communication. It's a matter of how your communities listen to the leadership. It's a matter of trust. There is a beautiful study done by Welcome Trust and the Gallup Institute just before COVID about trust. Trust is one of the biggest determinants of health that nobody is talking about. Without trust, just forget everything. People will not follow you. But if they trust you, they will follow you even if they don't understand everything and continue to explain. Hmm? So, the fact that I, I also lo love those two map, the one on the top, who is the prediction and the, the official map, and the one on below, who is the real geographic distribution, and where you can see where the Western supremacy 
in action, even in the book and the geography design of continent. Can you see how Africa is small and above and bigger down? Same for Latino America. Western supremacy is in everything. There is no area that has been, that have escaped that. Even in design like that, you just see who cares? There are people who cares. And those are the map that is given to our children. So um, what university can play as role? It's important to know, to, to, to think about that when you know that we have uh, three doctors for 10,000 people average uh, in Africa. And when we have uh, 13 nurses for 10,000 population uh, in Africa, in here, in Western world is 83, and uh, for doctors is 37. So it's important because even in those the countries here, it's not enough in rural area. So there are solutions that has been found in developing world that should be reflected how to use them in rural area here when there is not enough people to care about people who live in rural area. Soon we will be 2013. On the left, you have the SDGs and what the world committed to. Of course, we will not reach there. But you can see what has to be done on the right about gender equity, transportation, physical infrastructure for giving health, uh, health awareness, how we talk to the population in a way they will follow you because if they, if they don't get it, they will not follow you and you are, and you are in the mess because it's your job that you cannot do. Uh, nutrition, there are so many things. I just look at all the sugar I've in, in, uh, swallowed since I came and I like that, but uh, thanks God, I'm not going to stay here. <laughs> but in nutrition, we are doing so bad things knowingly. And the care delivery system in general, and uh, the communication system, education and political, political, political. I wrote here political stability, but you can have political stability in the wrong stability. Hmm? Sometimes it's better to move for change and for good than to just be not moving. So, it's important to build partnership. I put here partnership with Africa, but it's partnership in general, partnership among universities about, for doing research to understand better, uh, to go together for grant to do that, to share the outcome from our communities to see if it fits communities here, what are the difference, and what we can get from there, uh, how to create resiliency and be better prepared to future crisis, because COVID, we are lucky. COVID is not so damaging, of course, there was more than a million dead. It's not a, a little thing, but we are going to have worse than that. And we have to be ready to get to face worse than that. Hmm? And uh, to learn how from countries will get flexibility and adapted to threats uh, better, how we can learn from them. And we need also to increase, of course, South-South partnership, regional partnerships. And COVID have done that. You know, we have now the COVAX, we owe the vaccine together. Uh, and thanks God, because you know, Pfizer, we owe the vaccine, and I remember Canada. We owe the vaccine before Canada. We pay the vaccine. Canada came after us and said, we need this number of vaccine. Pfizer, 
took what was for us, paid, and sent to Canada. So I had to go and say, this is really white supremacy in action. Our money, that was dollar, has no value because we are black and we are not powerful. You believe that saving our people is not as much valuable than saving Canadian, especially because the, the rule of the market is first order, first pay, first serve, no? But not when it's Africa, et cetera. So we scream, et cetera. So they say, oh, so sorry, we don't know, we don't know. Huh? But I had to ask a friend the, 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 some numbers of uh, uh, Vice President of Pfizer and say, I'm going to do scandal on TV, say how racist you are. You just take our money and after that go and serve your people and serve us when something is really, uh, remain. We need to fight that as well. We also need to evaluate more what we do. We do great things, but we don't take enough lesson from them. We do great mess, but we don't take enough lesson from them as well. Oh, oh, this is me. So, <laughs> uh, no, not that. Minimize. But I think I have finished almost, except that I can minimize. Okay, it was very simple. <laughs> uh, so um, I think we, we need to reflect and to study more what we do according table like this, because it helps us according the SDGs to see how we progress and uh, ranking, I don't like ranking, but it's good to rank yourself with yourself. That's the most important thing. Don't look compared to the others, but say, I'm starting here, do I progress? So this is something to do. We also need to use innovation. And uh, this is one innovation that I like every day during the peak of the pandemic, not, not now, but during the peak of the pandemic, we had the number of cases diagnosed that day, the number of cases hospitalized, the number of cases diagnosed from the beginning, the number of cases diagnosed from the, the number of deaths, etc. so that with transparency, all the population can follow on Twitter what happened. And this is Twitter for those who have internet, but it was also like that in newspaper, in the radio, etc. So this is important, sharing what you do with the people for who you work. Um, include innovation in uh, everything you do. I'm going to accelerate because I can see that it's time. But um, you need to assess your situation. Many people are working, working, doing great work, but they don't know where they this, this stand compared to their landscape. They could do better. They could do other partnership. They could do synergy that make things cost less. They may increase the contextual factors that are facilitators and together work on what is the, um, I think it's finished, but I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> and, and together work on what are the obstacles. The only thing I want you to understand, we can all do great things, but never alone. Thank you.
Thank you for that provocative. I love how you just tell it like it is. <laughs> and there's so many comments I, I would have, but I don't want to scoop our discussants. So um, we'll invite you back up here shortly um, for the Q&A. But I'd like to invite uh, Professor Joe Wong, um, who is the Ralph and Roz Halbert Professor of Innovation at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. And he's also a professor in the Department of Political Science here at the university. And he also serves as Vice President International for the University of Toronto. Um, I'll leave it at that. I mean, there are many things I could say about Joe and he's a wonderful colleague and I'm delighted that he will provide some um, reflections on what he's just heard. And then he will be followed by Tolu Ocho, who's a PhD student at the Institute of Health Policy and Management at the Dalana School of Public Health. And uh, she holds a master's degree in control of infectious diseases from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And um, her research is actually focusing right now on access to, to medicines and equity. And again, I could say so much more about Tolu, but thank you also Tolu for agreeing to offer some remarks. So Joe, I'll invite you um, up to provide some reflections, then Tolu, and then I'll have all of you join here for the Q&A. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, um, Erica, for that kind introduction. And thank you, Dr. Agnes, for just an extraordinary talk. Um, I had the good fortune of spending an hour and 20 minutes with Dr. Agnes yesterday in my office. And it was actually scheduled for one hour, but we ended up going over time. And while she sat magisterially telling me about how the world worked, I think I was pacing around my office, changing seats, drawing graphs on my whiteboards and so forth. It was just an extraordinary educative experience for me. Uh, Dr. Agnes, as you've seen just now, is extraordinarily provocative, accomplished. She's insightful. Um, she clearly doesn't suffer fools, as in, I think, the first 10 minutes of her conversation, she was looking a little askance at me, like, why am I here? Um, and she is candid and unapologetically honest. Uh, and for that, I, I wanted to offer just three reactions to her talk, as well as to some of the conversations that we had yesterday. Uh, for many in this room, you may know that in addition to my administrative role at the university, one of the core research areas that I work in is through this work that we're doing around reaching the hardest to reach. And I've had the good uh, privilege and honor of working with several in this room, in court, including with, with Tolu, on this very question of how do interventions reach those who are the hardest to reach, the most uh, impoverished, uh, the most marginalized, the most remote, uh, geographically remote, and so forth. And what drives that research is a goal that we must reach 100%. When we talk about universalism, it's not about 60% or 70% coverage. As Dr. Agnes repeatedly said in my office, it's about 100. We've got to reach 100. And that means that we have to reach everybody. And that means that not a single person can be left behind. It's been 50 years almost since Almada's declaration was made. And it's shameful with the resources that we have at our disposal, so inequitably and unequally distributed that we have not even come close to achieving that goal set in 1978. Reaching that 100% and indeed reaching that very last person, both Dr. Agnes and I agreed, requires different ways of thinking. It requires different implementation. That's why implementation science is so important. Reaching that very last person is going to require innovations and policies and collaborations that are different than reaching that 50th percentile or the 50th percent coverage. In other words, we have to start thinking if we are truly being serious about reaching everyone, whether it be on a global scale, a national scale, a local scale, we need to start thinking about reaching from the outside in. That we can't just simply rely on scaling up from the metropole and assuming that through some contiguous form of scaling that we're going to reach everyone, because to reach those on the margins is going to require a different kind of implementation. And that's going to require a changed mindset. And this is a conversation that I think as we start looking towards post-2030 that we have to seriously start having. It's conversations we need to have our policymakers thinking about, that the academics have to think, think about, the NGOs, the private sector, as well as the donors. We had a really uh, 
animated conversation of the role of donors who demand to see results fast. They demand to see results in the lanes that they have provided, PEPFAR and HIV. Anything beyond that is, without, is out of scope. We need to change that mindset if the goal is truly to reach every single person. Which leads to my second reflection, and it's something, again, that Dr. Agnes and I talked about yesterday. When I asked her, because she referred to it in terms of culture, and she referred to uh, this as being a culture of solidarity. And this strikes me as incredibly important. And I have tended to come at it as a political scientist from the lens of how do you generate political will? How do you infuse an ethic or a principled commitment to reaching the hardest to reach in our public policy? How do we, for instance, begin to move away from conversations around equality to equity? Because equity, in fact, identifies the real culprit, which is the reversal of historical decisions that have marginalized people in the first place. It's not about equalizing, it's about restitution. It's not about simply compensating to equalize, it's about restitution in order to create more equitable outcomes. That strikes me as being the, the core of a culture of solidarity. I framed it as an ethical principle. Dr. Agnes said, well, that's one of many ways in which we can think about a culture of solidarity. We need to think about a collective will. We need to think about a command structure. We need to think about different interests and different self-interests and how do we align them. We need to think about narratives that bind people together as opposed to excluding people. All of these things, again, I think provide for us a multi-dimensional view of what a culture of solidarity might entail, all of which is to say that it's absolutely critical to any mission we may have collectively in reaching those who are the hardest to reach, in achieving, as Dr. Agnes so bluntly puts it, achieving 100%, achieving 100. 93% is not good enough. 100% is the goal. Which takes me to the third reflection and something I was really happy to see Dr. Agnes speak about in terms of the role of universities. And here I'm going to, for a moment, put on my vice president hat, um, because this is something that I think about a lot in the context of my, leader, my role here at the University of Toronto. And some of you will have heard this before, um, usually in the academic seminar room, but it's something that I think also deserves publicly airing. Uh, as Dr. Agnes has noted, and I share with you your assessment, that we're not going to reach our 2030 goals, which means that we have to start thinking about what the post-2030 agenda is going to look like, which means that there are soon to be tables being convened around the world in which pointy-headed thinkers are going to start wondering and start planning and start scheming about what the post-2030 agenda is going to look like. And it strikes me that this is an opportunity for universities to be at that table. When I think back, for instance, to the construction of the SDGs, what animates and drives the global development agenda currently, this was a set of conversations that were framed around an intergovernmental agreement. The private sector, of course, joins in later with the formation of the global compact, but universities weren't at the table. Universities are the place where many of the technological innovations, including vaccines most recently, are being developed. Universities are where we have social scientists and humanities scholars that help us understand how best to implement interventions and life-saving interventions. And I think most importantly, and certainly here at the University of Toronto, where we have nearly 100,000 students who turn over almost every four years. This is an extraordinary global talent pipeline. The leaders who are going to execute the post-2030 agenda are not me, are not Dr. Agnes, they are in our classrooms today. So it strikes me that we ought to have a seat at that table. But as Dr. Agnes also reminded me, they're not gonna ask you to be at that table. They're not going to invite universities to be at that table. You have to advocate. You have to demand that the university sector be at that table. 
So how do we make that demand? How do we advocate for that demand? It's one thing to simply uh, pile on with the rhetoric and to plead, but it's another to start thinking strategically as a sector, as educators, as a higher education sector, as research powerhouses, how we might earn a seat at that table. We need to begin to start thinking about plans. We need, as I've always thought, to correct the error of the SDG agenda, which was to say in cartographical terms, we'll have baseline and targets, but we have absolutely no theories about how we're gonna get from point A to point B. This is the job of researchers and students in our labs, seminar rooms and classrooms right now. We need to start laying out a blueprint of how we can actually achieve these goals as opposed to simply talking about them and creating some sort of thermometer where we look to chart or a dashboard where we look to chart our progress or sadly our lack of progress. And we need to really think about coalition building and partnerships. And this is something I think that is very powerful in the comments that Dr. Agnes just offered us. And there is a role for universities like U of T to play in this, in part because we ought to be reminded that Canada is also a signatory to the SDGs. The SDGs are not an agenda for poorer countries. It's most egregious, the fact that we are not gonna reach the SDGs in our own rich country. But we need to also think about what role can universities like the U of T play in the global agenda around reaching our post 2030 goals. Most recently, the University of Toronto um, uh, co-created uh, a health collaborative alliance with eight African universities. And this was a process that took many years, many visits uh, over the development of many friendships with people. And one of the core principles that drives this health collaborative is that it is in Africa, by Africans, for Africans. And that the University of Toronto may be one partner in this network, but this network is centered on the continent. To put a finer point on it, for instance, I have requested that in my office of the Vice President International, that we have scrubbed the word help from every single one of my briefing notes every single one of our public uh, materials and every one of my speaking notes. The University of Toronto is not in any position to help. We're in a position to learn. We're in a position to be in a reciprocal relationship with our partners on the continent. We track now very closely, for instance, the number of co-publications that uh, involve uh, a co-author from the continent. I'm very happy to share that that number has tripled uh, in terms of a percentage over the last 15 years here. I'm sad to report that it only accounts for 6% of our total publications here at the University of Toronto. That is now a target in my office to continue to see growing. It also behooves us to really take seriously this notion of co-creation, a word I fear that is too casually bandied about, a word that in many ways launders what could actually be quite egregious and quite nefarious practices. It's something that we actually have to approach with modesty and humility and constant self-reflection. What does it mean to be co-creating with partners? Only when we do all of this, when we establish a coalition of university partners, where we establish a plan, where we have a demonstrated record of collaborative research that demonstrates a way forward in achieving our goals, only then is it that we can demand a seat at that table? So I uh, ask all of you uh, as colleagues here at the University of Toronto, as well as our friends and colleagues from around the world to work together uh, so that we can earn that spot at that table and address many of the concerns that Dr. Agnes has raised for us today. Thank you. Hello everyone. It's truly an honor and a pleasure and a privilege really to be here and to have the opportunity to speak and to provide some thoughts and remarks following the really insightful and provocative as Dr. Joe mentioned presentation that we've had today. 
So I think what I would like to add really is to maybe reflect on some of my experiences as an African woman who is also a PhD student who studies access to essential medicines and somebody who has been in the health space. And I hope that as I share some of my experiences, it will surface some of the really, some of the points that Dr. Agnes and Dr. Joe spoke about today. So following my master's degree, and I've said this story, so a few of you might have heard this before, I moved back to Nigeria to participate in what is known as the National Youth Service. It's a social development program where you're paired with an institution in capacity of social development. And this really introduced me to public health. I was paired with an organization that did HIV access work, and this was really my, my first introduction to health service delivery. A few years later, I find myself the monitoring and evaluation lead of a project focusing on improving the quality of basic emergency maternal and neonatal care for mothers in a rural town in northern Nigeria. So as with most funded projects, and Dr. Joe touched upon funding and Dr. Agnes as well, funding is provided by our foreign donors and there are requirements to funding. And funders would visit the site, come once or twice in the project life cycle to come and look at, you know, with the list of indicators to look at if you're performing well, performance. And the question I hope it's triggering is performance and assessment by who. So one of the things I had to do was pick a facility that the funders would assess. And so I picked the facility and to ensure there was no bias, the, the local government was also responsible for selecting their own facility that the funders would assess. So I need you to follow me and you know use a little bit of your imagination with this. So we, we earn our four by fours in the terrain, we get to the facility that I have selected. Picture this, it's a, a bit of a rundown dilapidated facility. It's not painted on, there's no painting. It's a bit muddy outside, the, a bit of the roof is rusty and I could just see the faces just falling aghast. What is, where, where has she brought us to? So they walk in, you know, trying to avoid some, you know, the mud and go in and start to talk with the healthcare worker. And as Dr. Agnes mentioned, a lot of the providers are not necessarily educated. They're not doctors. This was a CHU. The head of this facility was a CHU, a community health extension worker. And he manned this facility, which included some nurses and midwives. But the head of the facility was an informally trained CHU. And they asked him about his qualifications and he looked at me a bit quizzically, but he continued, you know, he, he spoke to them and they looked at the records. And when they looked at the records, you would see that there were hundreds of deliveries in this facility. And you could see that the mothers, you know, they were attending their antenatal visits. And you could also see that, you know, after a few months, they came back for their postnatal visits. So they had questions, still looked at me a little quizzically, and then we proceeded to the next facility, the facility selected by the government. Now this facility was beautiful to look at. I need you to, you know, once again, use your imagination. The walls were, it was brick. It had a fence, it had a gate. And we walked in and they spoke to the health, the um, facility in charge, to so the head of the facility. And he was trained out of state and they spoke to him and then we started looking at the records. And the last two quarters, no deliveries there were maybe a handful of mothers who had, who had visited that facility. And so I, you know, I relaxed a bit. Okay, I would keep my job, right? So I think this story that I've shared can surface a few things from, you know, what we have, what we've been speaking about today. So the first thing I think is really thinking about power dynamics. I think that we all hopefully need to recognize, we all hopefully realize that there are power dynamics at play when it comes to public health. And we need to ask ourselves and recognize those power dynamics. So just show of hands here, who here believes that COVID-19 demonstrated global partnerships and cooperation and all of us pulling in one direction? I'll give it, you know, a little bit, partnerships, okay, I see. But generally, I would say, no. I think that for me, what the relationship and the fact that the, the local government officials had selected that shiny facility that was not really used by the community, 
it really spoke to power dynamics and it showed that there was no real partnership really between the funders and the government. At least those are my thoughts. And what we saw as Dr. Anya described was we all pulled for ourselves, right? So with the Canadian example, like for anyone who is here or just globally, it was about vaccine nationalism. As somebody who studies access to essential medicines, you look at the disparities, right? And these are all based on power dynamics. So we need to be, we all need to be conscious of these power dynamics that exist across institutions, that exist in the funding agencies and the recipients as well. And we need to think about who put these structures in place. And I think we all have a little part to play, whether you're an educator in this room, as Dr. Joe mentioned, whether you're like me and you're a student, future um, global health practitioner, researcher, think about the power dynamics when you enter into a room and you interact with others. So the second thing I wanted to discuss, which was also highlighted when we think about education is our knowledge systems. We, and I said this earlier, thinking about whose voice matters. So let's look about, think back to COVID as well, as was demonstrated in that beautiful map that was shown earlier. I remember being here and, you know, being part of those conversations, Africa is, in, you know, in turmoil, this pandemic is going to wipe out Africa. And I did not know this, I learned this about the initial meeting in Ethiopia. But if you look at the response, I know that in, I believe it was in um, Central African Republic, the first task force around COVID was around April, just a few weeks, about six weeks after the declaration of the pandemic. In Nigeria, it was in April, I believe, April or May, my dates might be a little off, right? But I believe the first task force around screening and response in Canada, and if anyone in this room was part of that, those committees, please, you know, show of hands, were in October and November. Africa did have a lot of knowledge from the HIV pandemic, the HIV epidemic, and from dealing with Ebola in 2014 when I first moved back to Africa to work on my national youth service. Then the last thing I think I would want to highlight is really that idea of trust. And that I think that what COVID has done, it has shattered trust in governments. We're building back on risky grounds communities don't trust in scientists even at the beginning of the pandemic there was a lot of trust in scientific data but we no longer trust the science when we don't trust our governments and i love the fact the example that was shown earlier dr anis mentioned vietnam vietnam bordering china you would think would be in a very vulnerable position but a study was done to show that it was really by leveraging on local organizations the country was able to be, build trust that really helped advance the COVID response. And I believe the number of COVID deaths per 100,000 was about less than was about 40 compared to 320 in the United States with all the resources. So it really does highlight what was mentioned earlier in terms of thinking about trust and partnerships and really engaging from the community level and the local level, which was what was mentioned earlier. And even we don't need to look too far, even when you look here, who's left behind, right? So even in Canada initially, when the rollouts, I believe there was an article I saw that showed in St. Clair and Rosedale, this was, you know, 2021, early in the, in the response, vaccination rates were around, um, were five times as high as in Jane and Finch, right? Which are, um, which are communities or neighborhoods with lower socioeconomic status but they had eight times the, the COVID-19 burden. So we don't need to look too far. We don't need to just really look at the global landscape to see that the vulnerable are those who are left behind. And part of what you need here is to be able to build those trusting relationships, right? So it's people who do not, who maybe do not have identification, people of low socioeconomic status, like I mentioned earlier, that will, that will continue to be left behind if we do not start to think about some of those things and start to implement some of those things I mentioned. So thinking about the power dynamics, thinking about whose knowledge is appreciated and whose knowledge gets leveraged. So the data that was shown in terms of the number of publications coming from the, from the low and middle income countries compared to high income countries, for example. I remember here just seeing lots of, I feel like it was a good time for researchers to just pump out data. But was that data as 
discussed? Was that being used? Was that data really used to inform or and advance the benefit of the people? Or were we just pumping out research because that's what we do as researchers and we look good and we have you know, your index in a publication. So taking a page out of um, Joe and Dr. Agnes's page to be a bit bold and to challenge everyone in this room. If you're here, I'd like to believe that you know you do believe in equity and equality and the things we've been talking about today. And if you're here, you're either an educator, you are a researcher or a public health practitioner in some in some way. And thinking about building back post COVID, thinking about the post 2030 agenda, I hope you consider the things I mentioned. So I hope you consider how you play a role in power dynamics. I hope you consider how you are able to facilitate and maybe support in giving a voice to the communities that you work with and how you're able to be part of building trust and relationships. Thank you. So Joe and Prof Agnes, if I can encourage you. So thanks to both of our discussants for excellent reflections on a very provocative and multifaceted talk. Um, so we have an opportunity to hear from you if you have any questions or reflections. I don't see any hands up, but I do see a hand up already, right? Okay, do we want to start here in the front? And then I'm just going to be going back and forth. I have the questions from the folks online. So periodically I'll be doing that. So go ahead. Thank you. And hopefully the mic works. Is thank it you. working? Yes. Okay, good. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Everyone uh, here? Yeah, yes. Thank you very much for uh, the discussions and the presentations. I'm just wondering, uh, Dr. Agnes and also Joe and Patilu as well, thinking about um, the value and the power structures in Africa and the roles that policymakers and especially legislators in government have when it comes to um, health service delivery and the quality of care available to people in Africa. What role do you think, I mean, how do you think academia can do a lot more when it comes to influencing those key uh, personalities in our systems and ensuring that we can actually achieve equity? So how can academia um, educate policymakers in understanding the needs and then strengthening that in how you develop policy and resources for healthcare. I say this because of my work in Nigeria, and I can give an example of two states in Nigeria who throughout the uh, uh, COVID-19 period reported zero cases of, of COVID-19. Mm. And, and that's because the governors of these two states said COVID does not exist and does not exist in their states and ensured that surveillance officers that worked within their states did not track COVID, did not report COVID. And that's an example of the kind of um, barriers we face when it comes to um, addressing equity in, in my space in Nigeria. Thank you. What doesn't get measured doesn't count, but yeah, yeah. yes. Um, who would like to respond to that, I think? So this is not a Nigerian problem and not an African problem. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Remember UK. The, because for me, the problem is African. We Africanize all problems and we Europeans all solutions. So um, in Nigeria, let me um, remember that you were very active in COVID detection and you used the polio team mm -hmm. because th there was a big movement to research who was vaccinated or not against polio. And those team was exactly taken as it is for COVID. So stop, you did well. <laughs> Not enough, like many countries, but don't undermine what your people have done. Mm -hmm. Build on that. That's my answer. Did yeah. I answer? <laughs> well, you provided a perspective, um, I, which I think is important. And actually, Nigeria was lauded for it, the development of its surveillance system be, before COVID, right? And it was able to wrap it. But I think you're highlighting a transparency issue, perhaps, um, that certainly manifests itself um, about by denying that something doesn't exist, it just doesn't get measured. Yeah, so, but Tanzania yeah. was worse because yeah. it was at the highest level of the government. Mm -hmm. 
and also people who are not free to say that the president was a liar. Uh, and it's not the only country. Uh, it's, I think in Africa, Nigeria was not the worst. And I'm not sure that you got the worst results. Okay, very briefly, but then we do have a reception for further discussion because I do want to give a chance so, to others. Yeah, so I think <laughs> my, my concern actually isn't with the COVID response. I, I, I mean, I was part of that process, so I, I know this, it's strengths. It's more sure. how, I mean, how can academia actually uh, educate or help to influence decision making by putting more attention, exchanging knowledge okay. so with... So I, I agree. I yeah, just want you to remove Nigeria and put global. That's why, because it's, uh, don't, don't torture yourself. It's a problem that is global. And we say that, uh, mm -hmm. we, we both say that, academia are not in the table of the discussion in general. In my country, they are. Mm. The School of Public Health represents academia and they have a voice mm. uh, on the table. It's not only in Rwanda, you have that also in Bangladesh. And you have, uh, a uh, good example of how to do and even how to improve. So I'm, I'm going to go to the next question, if that's all right, because we could probably riff off the same question. But um, Michelle, um, and uh, and then I'm going to take a question from, from online. Um, go ahead. Thank you. I'll try to be brief. But um, Dr. Agnes, you made a really compelling and quiet point about rankings. And I'm wondering if you, any of you, want to reflect on um, how we do rankings, whether that's in the post-secondary environment or in the global health rankings that we do, and the impact that has on trust and effective partnership. Joe, do you want to start with that one, or? <laughs> I get to pick who answers. No. <laughs> Just kidding, <laughs> if you well, will. Um... Universities wouldn't be the first to be accused of being obsessed with rankings, um, <laughs> ours included. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a ranking that I think that the U of T community um, is proud of, but I think you raise a, let me put it in the context of partnership building. So there was a time when, as an institution, as part of our strategic plan, which predates my time as vice president, um, <laughs> <laughs> we had a statement in there that we would partner with peer institutions. Mm -hmm. And many, um, I suspect many in this room as well, and certainly tables that we convened, I know Erica did have a lot to say, um, about what it meant, uh, what we meant by peer institutions. And that, you know, peer institutions, if we were to go by global rankings, would limit us to a very few set of partners, and they would be partners that looked a lot like us, and it would contribute to the, uh, the continued structural inequalities that Dr. Agnes um, uh, very um, you know, succinctly raised for us in terms of where the research output is and where its relevance might be. And so we've changed that, actually. So we continue to talk about peer institutions, but that peer institutions are not um, determined by rankings, but, a, but by alignment of values, principles, and impact. Hmm. And that has opened up an entirely new vista of partnership opportunities. Um, it means that we have to get to know our partners much better. It's not simply about looking at where you are on the league tables, but rather actually knowing who your partners are and doing a lot of listening in terms of what their needs are and what our needs are, and actually developing reciprocal relationships. So um, rankings is but one currency, and uh, at least in terms of this university, we are moving further and further away from relying on that sole currency. Thanks, Joe. Anyone else want to comment? I can add to that, but from the perspective of thinking about funding and how, especially when we're thinking about a lot of programs in development space, in health, of course, because that's what we're talking about, how funding gets allocated. So I, in my vignette, my story, I mentioned facilities, right? And at the time, there was funding was part of the funding that was allocated to facilities was based on their performance, based on structural indicators, for example, and process indicators, and less so on outcome indicators, surprisingly. But 
So if you were to rank the facilities, the facility that I mentioned first, the one I had selected would potentially maybe you know, come lower down on the ranking compared to the second facility, right? So as uh, Dr. Joe mentioned, there, this has implications. The way we consider rankings has implications on even the way the funding that's available to programs and how resources are, are distributed, which further increase inequities, because that means the vulnerable populations are not getting the funding they're requiring, because you know, those who have the resource and the power of getting more funding. But thankfully, I do believe that conversation is happening. Maybe can speak to that, where we're having those conversations as to what, how do we assess, how do we evaluate, and what are the rankings that we're using in terms of allocating resources to institutions and organizations and programs. So you need, you need to have a national way to do that. And for health facilities, remember, because it's not even remember, it's, uh, it's ongoing. You have the accreditation process that is ongoing in many countries. But there is also another type of uh, quality assessment that is done. Remove that. This is really giving work for people who are doing nothing. <laughs> Just looking the others working and give marks, you know. But what is important is the workers to own it and the workers to come together every month before sending their report out to analyze what they have done, how they have done it and what is the outcome. And the work and those health facilities coming together to give standards for the country. Standards have to be country led, cannot be led by outside. When you do that, now you have a national tool for national improvement. And you can also compare health facilities with other health facilities and bring um, and make them interact to see what they have done. And that's make all your health sector moving for good. And when it's peer reviewed, it has always, it is always more powerful than top down or external or whatever. Now, don't add that to the so many evaluation people have. Choose one evaluation, make it complete and ask everybody to follow it. You want your specific indicators, global fund. Okay, we add it there, or you take those who are there. Because sometimes the, the, the global fund indicator is how many pregnant women has been tested. The PEPFA one is how many women who deliver has been tested, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm? How many women with a child under five has been tested? This will be the third bring them on the table and say, choose one. Hmm? And stop making our life miserable. And it works, you know, because it's something that country doesn't know. In the kitchen, in my kitchen, I'm the one who decide how the pizza is made. <laughs> and all countries have that power. They just believe that if they wake up and say something, they will lose the money you never lose the money for being demanding. You lose the money for not performing. Yeah, here, here. And, you know, if I can just add on indicators, I think there are many indicators that actually have to be retired, you know, um, because they perpetuate the, them. the medical field, there were 800 yeah, indicators. Yeah, exactly. 800. Yeah. We, desire, we, we bring them to 200, and slowly by slowly, uh, Especially because we are not working for that, we are working mm -hmm. for people. Yeah. Takes a lot of resources, creates a huge response burden on countries to actually continue to report on things that actually aren't measuring the right things and, and things that are more important to measure. Um, I'm going to just go to a question um, online and then, was there another hand? Oh, you'll, you'll go next? Okay, so one, the question um, online was, what approaches could reduce brain drain since healthcare workers are free to choose their location, free, um, even if we stop high income countries from deliberately recruiting 
in low and middle income countries. Professor Agnes, I don't, I don't know if you want to take that question since you certainly raised it. I think that first of all, uh, you can sign a contract before educating people that you will work this number of years in your country for your full salary. People will sign it. And we have created that for uh, medical education. It was uh, three years. It was increased to, to five. For a master, it's four years. Uh, for a PhD, it's five. Mm -hmm. So that at least you have time to renew the pool if people want to go. We need to keep the la li a liberty. It's not because that you were able to study that you became a slave. That's no. But having to pay back, that's the minimum. Because the, the money that pay your study are money that is collected to the taxes of people that are poorer than you. We are the minority in our, in our countries. So the majority of people who pay taxes is less than us and we're supposed to serve them by being educated with their money. So, yes. And also sure. few government yeah. who... Uh, <laughs> when all else fails. <laughs> Joe, go ahead. And then I'll, I'll come to you after, okay? Just a quick note. Um, drawing on the example of this health collaborative that we've recently established um, brain drain of course was one of the primary concerns there as well and um, and you know the numbers don't lie I mean we cannot uh, pretend it doesn't exist um, and so as part of that network um, the, the University of Toronto has made a principal commitment in our charter of principles to partnership with our collaborators that any scholarship student from Africa as part of this collaborative network that comes to U of T for any program that we are committed to providing uh, at least one opportunity or pathway back to the continent so that any student who comes here who has um, uh, a desire to return to the continent and contribute in that way we will make it easier so in our most recent trip to Kigali, for instance, uh, we had meetings with your successor in the Ministry of Health to say, look, we are expecting 20 plus graduate students um, from Rwanda to make their way through U of T. Can we establish uh, career paths for them here, back in the ministry or in one of the agencies for these graduates? And so as much as we've negotiated the scholarships to bring students here, we're spending as much time negotiating the paths back to the continent. So this is a principled commitment that U of T has made, and it's one that uh, we are expecting that we're going to live up to on our end. So this is one way, mm -hmm. a very small way of trying to address that challenge. And inside the country, sorry to take the floor, but <clears throat> inside the country, don't expect the Ministry of Health to solve it. There is another minister called the Minister of Labor. You know, and those are the ones who, cre who create the budget to pay the people who are working. Mm -hmm. So it has to be um, when universities talk, don't talk to the Minister of Health. You better talk to the Minister of Labor. Hmm? I talk to both together. That's the cross sectoral collaboration point you were making earlier. It's a great example. We're going to go back there. Um, go ahead. Hi. Um, one way to improve access to healthcare might be to incorporate it in the definition of quality of healthcare. Somehow we pay a lot of attention to quality metrics in any healthcare situation, but if you could slice and dice that data by gender, race, postal code, we might find some interesting aspects. And then if it's considered part of quality, we might pay more attention to it than just uh, so just to uh, borrow something from economics, uh, during pandemic, the government introduced CERB, the emergency relief program, and you know who did not get it? The panhandlers on Blur Street, because they were not part of the tax system. 10% uh, or so of the lowest, those who can least afford, were left out of lots of the government benefits. 
and somehow we have to think uh, now that's not even a contagious thing healthcare is even more important because it's even more uh, but what the economic system and the healthcare system have a access issue and how to get uh, get access to those who are least accessible in one way and to think about but quality is one way of mentioning for example in hospitals they pay a lot more attention to quality metrics than they pay attention to edi but if we could get edi to be called quality then we might pay more attention to them yeah quality is synonymous with edi right but it depends on who you ask um, and i think your example about the panhandler not accessing serb um, just speaks to who's um, invisible in the system. It's an example of informal work, right? What we would call informal work. Um, and we certainly saw that in many countries um, around the globe where they were disproportionately impacted by some of the public health measures because they couldn't go out in the street, but they, their livelihoods were dependent on being out in the streets. So glad you raised that. I'm just going to... Um, uh, go to a so, question. Sorry, but one yeah. way to sure. escape to that trap is to make Come sure that the people mm -hmm. who represent people with disability are on the table of discussion. Mm -hmm. And uh, to, to do that, what you need on a table before taking a decision is the youth, the women, the private sector, a representative of the public sector, because we most of the time forgot that sector. It's not because it's the Minister of Health that the Minister of Health represents the, the, the public sector. And make sure that, so we have uh, the people living with an handicap and uh, the district, etc. So there is 10 people that, has, that represent, they need to represent the constituency. So that means the youth who is on the table have to be elected by the youth of the country. By taking the district, they elect, they bring them together, they elect, they bring them a national, they elect. Hmm? So that when you talk to that very youth or that very woman or that very people living, person living with an handicap, you talk to all of them. And it's their business to bring the concern of their constituency. Mm -hmm. It makes the life of the health sector so easy. Mm -hmm. You just have to listen to 10 people and you listen to the nation. We did that, it works. It's about who's around the table <laughs> in the first place, yeah. I'm just going to read out another question we got from online and then I'll come to you, Bev, after. Um, so, um, one of the comments online was those who own the journals or own the narrative on scientific knowledge, i.e. successes in pandemic response. So how can Western researchers, institutions, and those engaged in knowledge translation partner with those in the Global South to change the narrative and share the successes in health sciences and pandemic response in Africa and other parts of the Global South? What are some conditions that need to be in place for an equitable collaboration and what strategies work to build those true partnerships. So multi-part <laughs> question, but you can take any part of it. Uh, Tolu, why don't I start with you? Because um, any thoughts on that question? Sure, um, it's, it's a great question. Considering I, I feel like I've been part of publications or consortia, et cetera, where a lot of the work speaking in African context is done. And then when you look at the, you know, the authorship list, it's always, someone in the Western world, first author, second author, maybe all the way down to fifth author, and then there's the person who did the actual work is somewhere lost in the, the mire of it all. So I think, and part of it is if you look at the contracts that are written, right? So when there's an agreement between an organization, I'll just say maybe CDC in Nigeria and CDC in the US, right? And discuss publications, it's the owner, the, this work is owned by the, the CDC. And, Maybe I can turn to you know, experts on this table, but perhaps we can start to erase some of that language. So um, Dr. Joe talked earlier about really erasing some language that is not is really useful, right, in some of the contracts. So similarly, can we have contracts that reflect or that the language reflects, like this work is owned by the people who do the, to, owned or in partnership, right, in partnership with the people who do the work. But I don't know what it takes for that to happen. I'm not there yet. so. I think it requires just a lot of advocacy work around this, so I'll leave it to others at the table to discuss. I think we are very far. We are just ignorant about the fact. Those questions have been raised 10 years ago. 
Now, who is funding the um, research? Governments in the Western world, uh, big foundation, they all agree. Just tell them, you know, you fund these guys, they came and do the study and they, they believe they own the, the data. Ha! They will be in trouble, my dear. So that means take on you and stand up because it's no longer the case. Go to Rockefeller Foundation, Bill Gates Foundation, go to UK government, go to all those people. They, they, they will not agree that people run away with your data. They will not. It's just because uh, spread the word. They will not. And if they did, my Twitter account is Arobas Agnes. <laughs> did you hear that? <laughs> well, and actually, I think um, researchers have also um, exposed um, journals who aren't also doing this. So one thing uh, Professor Agnes and I talked about a couple of days ago was that journal editors and reviewers can also call out publications that are coming in about a particular country that do not include a co-author from that country. That's unacceptable, but it happens. It still happens. And so, so there are many ways to do this. Um, can I go to you? Do you have an actual microphone? Or so over to, to Bev, and then I'm going to, is there anyone else in the room who has a question that right here and there? OK, I'll come back to you after, OK? No, just on that last point, I mean, I am a section editor for health policy and planning, and they, like many other journals now, require there to be a statement that, you know, papers are sent back if they're on a country or a region and there is no representation in the senior leadership of the off of that paper uh, from those regions. So I think those sorts of authorship contribution and positionality statements are becoming quite standard. Um, so my, my question, maybe it's more of a comment, is that, you know, I, I feel that our um, short-term memories in, in public health and global health is, you know, stalls our, has stalled our progress, has in many ways led to many, many failures. And, and I'm worried that we are seeing this happen with COVID. So there was a moment in time in the midst of the pandemic where for, for many people who had never thought about these inequities within the system, the light turned on and there was action and attention and you know, gender-based violence and gender inequities and all, everybody was excited about why and how these problems existed and how we want to ensure that we plan forward to, to, to address these issues. And so, you know, we're not even five years on, and I'm thinking about your question about where to from here that you've posed to us. There were pockets of action that showed us planning across sectors where labor was speaking to health, was speaking to finance, like, and we were planning very effectively in those little clusters, but I, that has not been systematized. That has not been become a routine approach. And so, I suppose my question to you all is as we look ahead to the end of the SDGs and we think about what more is needed to, to you know, continue on from here, you know, what are the approaches that we can take on? And I, and I ask you this in part as former health minister because this is not just about health. This is about some actions that require health to be speaking across the portfolios and the other portfolios speaking to each other to actually be meaningfully investing in planning for equity um, and not sort of thinking about it as, as an afterthought. <laughs> All right, so go ahead. To speak to that, I'll first here. reflect on a conversation I had then, earlier yeah. this week with Eric and Dr. Agnes, which was around, um, Erica termed it collective amnesia. I don't remember who coined that statement. That's not my statement. Ross Upshur. Okay, there we go. So, and thinking about, we had lessons from HIV. So I study access to medicine. So looking at HIV pandemic, a lot of the same things were repeated. So in terms of thinking about advocacy, in terms of thinking about whose voices are heard, in terms of thinking about how do we make sure um, prices are lowered so that everyone has equitable access. And the H HIV is still with us. And yet we're looking at COVID. Right at the beginning of the pandemic, Pierre Sum said he was the former prime minister of um, CAR, Central African Republic, wrote this excellent piece outlining lessons. I don't know who read it, but a lot mm. of the things we're talking about three years later, if you just go and read it, he, he summarized it because he was reflecting of, on his lessons from, on the lessons from HIV and Ebola, Central African Republic. 
So all of that to say is part of what we're doing here, I think, is really, you know, it's, it's, we tend to forget. It's, it's part of our behavior, we're always false, we forget the bad things, but it's part of our, our responsibility, everyone in this room, I think, to keep voice in those things, to really, in your capacities, to be working across the sectors, to make sure that you're, you're voicing and tabling these things so that we do not forget. So that, that's, those are my thoughts. Yep. Can I, um, is it all right if we jump to the uh, two or more questions? Just well, put go that ahead. in university in education of the next generation. Mm -hmm. So that no one gets out on the field without knowing that. Yep. If yep. not, we'll be there in 100 years. Not mm -hmm. us, but the next one. Yeah, that's a key call to us as well to do this. So can you ask your question, then I'm going to ask you to ask your question and then just in, to get a few more, but go ahead. Question was, I know you mentioned about sort of shifting from vertical um, systems and funding to more um, system strengthening. I know I also did an internship at Friends of the Global Fight and one of my main, even though I was an intern, I was like, we need to do more um, health systems um, strengthening and they're like, well, that's not really our mandate. So I guess my question is how do we get um, organizations to shift more from vertical to systems thinking and also how do we sort of shift this global health equity to also include countries in the so-called lower middle income or global south if you're calling it that way um, how do we get them sort of to I guess reshift financing so they're actually able we don't have to rely on western countries providing funding but we have the ability to sort of um, finance our own like re uh, health I guess research agendas <laughs> Joe, please ask. No, no, no. But go ahead. Can we get you to um, ask your question? Thank you. We're just going to grab a couple of questions at the same time. So go ahead. Sorry. So, yeah, I'm not um, an academic, but I am a nurse. So I work with Indigenous communities here. And, can you um, speak up a bit? Because I don't know if people can hear oh, you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, the matter of trust in, in with the community, especially with elders who have experienced, you know, colonization and, and, and um, you know, just genocide, generational genocide. How do we kind of um, create that? like bridge that gap between um, us healthcare workers who are non-Indigenous but are working in these communities and are, are coming there as almost like seen like in the in the community as like a, a representative of the, of the government when you're working in government-based um, healthcare centers. How do we create that trust between them uh, again and um, kind of bridge that gap and, and create more like reconciliation with with the people who are receiving our treatment. Okay. And before you answer, I'm just going to tag on a comment from online, which actually picks up nicely on some of your points and also picks up on Professor Agnes's point around the need to improve collective solidarity for health equity in a more holistic and integrated ways. Um, this is something that Black and Indigenous communities have continued to call for. And the, uh, the participant online is, you know, would love to hear your thoughts. Um, about how we can better move collectively towards holistic trauma-informed decolonial approaches to health equity and justice globally. So um, we just have five more minutes, so not easy questions, but um, perhaps, um, Joe, do you want to you know, comment on one or more of those questions? Okay. I'll be real quick. <laughs> just earn your salary. Yeah, yeah sure, you know, earn kidding. my salary. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Okay. Uh, I'm teasing you. Come on. Um, I think your question is such an important question. You know, we did a project part of the Reach Alliance last year on Operation Remote Immunity, which was the vaccine delivery initiative to deliver vaccines in the first wave to fly in remote Indigenous communities. Were you involved in that at all? Oh, okay. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. So when we first looked at the project and we worked with the Winnebago Area Health Authority and Lynn Innes and her colleagues, and, you know, the, the initial instinct was, you know, how do we, how are we thinking about this in terms of logistics? How are we thinking about this in terms of supply and so forth? And as you know, the number one variable is trust. Uh, and how do you build that trust? And, and I say variable in the sense that it truly does vary from community to community, from health worker to health worker, and so forth. And so it, I think that is a really underappreciated uh, probably extremely decisive variable that needs to be built into our model. 
And to the question that was raised online, which I think is related to that, is that you know sometimes we think of overcoming mistrust as overcoming a deficit. Um, but I want to just reiterate again, one of the comments that I made, which is more of an observation, is that when we actually change the frame from equal to equitable, we actually change the whole aim of the intervention, which is to not simply compensate uh, or make up, but rather it is really about redress. And until we change our mindset from one of compensation to redress, then I suspect we're going to have many challenges moving forward. But this is one of the sort of core fundamental tenets of equity, which makes it distinctive from equality. I think I'm going to pose this question to you still. The, the, the question on, uh, especially the, the first question, especially around thinking about, this is something I grapple with around how as you know, nations, low and middle income nations, that reliance on external funding from the global north, right? That was part of the question, the second question, how do we move towards that? For me, I have no problem. Money always come from a bank. So it can transit in London, UK, etc. The day it land in Rwanda, it's mine. <laughs> and I act like that. And if you don't want, we call it. So that means money, whatever place it comes from the world, inside the country or outside the country, is there for the national plan. The only thing you have to do, do the national plan with the nation. It's not a plan done in an office among you and your colleagues. So it seems to take time to do consultation from the bottom to the top, make sure that all um, you are concerned, uh, are taking in account and explain to those, those are where the view are not taking in account, why? Then everybody will work with you. Hmm? I have been a minister of health in a country I don't speak the language because I was a refugee at the age of three and I'm very lazy. I didn't want to learn the language. It takes too much time. I managed to run the health sector and create trust. When I left the health sector, I was so happy because the Welcome Trust and Gallup Institute show that the highest trust in the health sector was in my country. So that means it's even not about language. People see what you do for them. And people see when you fight for them and what you fight for. So there is a lot of things to do for access to care. You, have, you are enough skilled and knowledgeable to see what are the problem of the people, fight for them. They will be with you. Well, on that note, um, I wanna thank our three speakers for very provocative and um, reflexive um, comments. And I also just want to add that we've talked a lot about um, how to show up, right? And uh, move. we need to move beyond very performative leadership to transformative action. Your last example is indicative of you didn't speak the language, but through your actions, you built that trust and you kept earning it because you can the next day very much lose trust. And on that note, I just want to thank all three of you for joining us today and all of you and also those online. Sorry I couldn't get to all your questions. And uh, thanks again for a very wonderful afternoon.